This is Mises Weekends with your host, Jeff Dice. Hey, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back once again to Mises Weekends. It's Christmas time, so Merry Christmas to all of you who are celebrating this week, uh, trying to keep it upbeat and happy. And we do have some happy news today and the last couple of days, and that leads to our guest, comedian Dave Smith, the great comic from New York City. A lot of you know his work. And he's joining me to talk about all these things that are going on with Trump and foreign policy this week. And as I mentioned, there's actually some bright spots with respect to Syria. And maybe, just maybe, as of this recording on Friday afternoon, according to Jake Tapper, there might be a coming bright spot with respect to Afghanistan. But Dave, uh, not everybody sees it that way in our commentariat on Twitter, as you may have noticed. Yeah, it's uh, it's the amazing thing about Donald Trump. And obviously, this is this is one of the best things he's done, if not the best thing. But it's amazing that he kind of like, however you feel about Donald Trump from a, uh, a libertarian perspective, he really he cuts the grass and lets the snake show. Yeah. Well, let me ask this. Some people may not know you're a new father. You just had a little girl a week or so back. Uh, I, I, let me ask you a loaded question. Do you think in her lifetime, she will witness more wars or fewer wars than a little American girl born in, let's say, 1918. Well, man, I sure hope it's it's fewer. It's got to be were, fewer, doesn't it? If you were a little girl born in 1918, you saw some bad ones. And um, I, I honestly think there's that. Uh, it's an Albert Einstein quote that I'm gonna I'm gonna butcher, but he said something like. Uh, I I don't know what weapons will be used to fight the third world war, but the fourth world war will certainly be sticks and rocks. Hmm. So I, I just think but be, a lot of it because of the technology we have, I don't think we'll ever see those type of conflicts again because the elites know that they're vulnerable to nuclear attacks as well. Um, so and, and hopefully maybe, you know, this is what I used to be very optimistic about during the great Ron Paul uh, revolution moment. Um, that now with with technology and and mass communication, it's going to be harder and harder for the elites to sell these wars to the general public. And I I do think we're seeing a lot of that. Yeah. Interesting, though, don't you think ordinary people versus elites and nationalism versus globalism are more interesting questions than left versus right, at least for us? Well, I I mean, there are even the the questions that I would want to be more interesting, like statism versus voluntarism or something like that, whatever questions we may like to think of in in abstractions, those are the actual fights that are going on right now. and And I, I agree. I mean, there's like um there's this really great comedian, this left wing guy, Jimmy Dore, who's like a complete left winger. I mean, he's like, you know, uh, I think probably his biggest issue is like climate change. He supports a minimum wage. He, he probably has a million issues that I, uh, I would disagree with him. You would disagree with him on. But he just adamantly opposes these wars, opposes the elite, opposes, the, you know, the, the two party duopoly. And, and more and more, you know, I, I look at a guy like that as an ally. I mean, I don't really care if, you know, it's, it's almost like that other stuff seems to just be not as important. It's like, do you want to you want to stop the genocide in Yemen? You want to. OK, then we're, we're on the same team. Yeah. And when you see some of the photos of children uh, who have been killed or hurt, that's when you you start to drop, you know, uh, some Obamacare lawsuit as the most important be all end all here. So and as you mentioned, there have been some people on the left who have been really good this week. I noticed Caitlin Johnstone. I'm sure you're familiar with her has has been really good on Twitter. And I noticed one of the founding ladies of Code Pink. Uh, has been saying, ignore what the Democrats are saying. This is a wonderful development. But here's what a lot of Democrats are saying. Let me lay this out for you. This is Trump capitulating to Putin. Uh, Russia is now going to have this enormous influence across the Fertile Crescent. We're handing the Kurds over to Erdogan. And this is all uh, part, you know, part of Trump's weakness. I mean, it's it's really sickening if you think about it. Yeah, it's, it's just unbelievable. And, and it's... Um the effect that Donald Trump has had on on the Democrats and and the left, broadly speaking, has really been incredible. I mean, they're uh, they're like cold warriors now. This to me was the most the the development that I would never have been able to predict in my lifetime. That you would see you would see left wing you know Hollywood types who seem to think that you know like transgender bathrooms are the moral issue of our time. But they've completely abandoned even the pretense of being anti-war. Yeah, it's it's something else to behold. But there's a mania against Trump 
there's a psychosis that they will literally resurrect a cold war with Russia and everything that means to hurt this guy politically. And that's my sense of it anyway. And I don't think that is, it can, can ever be defended. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, it's, it's, it really is something. And, um, you know, I don't think it's actually any policy that Donald Trump has ever pushed or espoused that got them so furious about him. I think it, it is more of a cultural thing where he just, you know, if you, if you turn on like the Oscars or any of these like award shows, they all kind of like to, um, they like to pretend that they're humanitarian, even as they have these kind of extravagant celebrations of wealth. And there's something about Donald Trump who's just this unapologetic, like, uh, you know, I, I'm a winner and I got a model wife and I put my name up in big gold plated letters and, and I'm just an unapologetic straight white man who's rich that just drives them crazy. I, I, it's a fascinating psychological phenomenon. Have you uh, seen any of the right wing stuff this week about Syria? Like Ben Shapiro was criticizing Trump. I've seen National Review say that this is a terrible mistake. And, and what's interesting is I've seen some right wingers say, well, he didn't consult his military and intelligence uh, generals and operatives before making this decision. Of course, they're A-OK with the president unilaterally going into any country. But when it comes to withdrawal, all of a sudden this has to be uh, vetted by Congress and the intelligence community. Yeah, it's really it's really wild. I mean, it's it, it, at least more so than the people on the left. You kind of feel like, well, that's where they belong. Like they they th that's the typical right wing, you know, kind of talking point in, in, in America that he didn't. It's like, oh, well, you know, if you don't listen to all of the members of the military industrial complex or, or you don't at least, you know, give them a say in it, that's the problem. But well, the thing I find so interesting about Syria and I, I listened to the Ben Shapiro episode on it and it's just I don't even know what to say. It's it's not it's different than so many of these other wars where they can't even get their own talking points straight. Like, it's not even clear to me what what their position of why we have to stay there is. It, it's like, um, it, at least in Iraq, you know, it was like there were these lies. OK, you know, they, they weren't involved in 9-11. They didn't have weapons of mass destruction, but that's what they would say. And then it was like bringing democracy to the region or kind of like, you know, we broke it. We have to fix it. But in Syria, I've heard that it's we, we have to stay there because ISIS isn't really defeated. We have to defeat ISIS. Uh, I've heard that we it's going to be a win for Iran and and Russia. And then the big one that they were trying to sell that I'm, I'm very surprised actually seems to have been somewhat abandoned over the last couple of days is that this was all about regime change with Assad and that Assad was killing his own people and that he was this butcher. That one seems almost like they've backed off of it. Um, and, and I think a big part of that is that, uh, and this is, I think, because of the internet and and the prominence of people outside of, of the rise of people like outside of the establishment media, is that no one, I don't think anyone really bought that, that fake Assad gas attack. Uh, the, the the most recent one. And so I, I just think that like they've almost given up on that talking point. But, you know, to me, that's that's really what this is all about, is that they this was on the list of regime change, uh, regime changes that, you know, we were supposed to knock off and, and it, they're not they're not going to get this one. Assad has one. So they can't lay out a justification for us to be in Syria. I, I would suspect the vast majority of Americans couldn't find Syria on a globe. Uh, and yet we're supposed to be so committed to this thing and so freaked out when Donald Trump decides to just withdraw what it, what it amounts to a couple thousand people out of Syria. But what I love about this, Dave, is it really is bringing home this sort of inside the beltway versus outside the beltway uh, divide. There's nobody out in America who really cares about this war and is passionate about prosecuting. All the support for this, and I would say all of our Middle Eastern wars, really resides inside the beltway. I mean, it's remarkable. It's, it's, it's really unholy if we think about it. The American people are either war-weary, disillusioned, uninterested, whatever it is, but they don't care. And they don't, and they don't believe them. Right. That, that's the other thing. It's like they just they don't believe any of these these phony, you know, like I excuses. They don't believe the propaganda anymore. This this to me is the the biggest silver lining out of all of this stuff. And I, I do think that it's just the the you know, it's like when, when you see with with this stuff with uh, Michael Flynn, mm -hmm. where everybody in the mainstream media is like so appalled that he lied. Like this was his great crime. It wasn't even anything illegal when he was talking to this Russian diplomat. It's just that he he lied to the FBI about it. 
And I think even if most of the, uh, uh, you know, the average person in America outside of the Beltway, okay, they're not reading, you know, human action and they're not thinking through these things like, like, you know, a lot of the people at the Mises Institute are. But I think just on some very basic gut sense, it's like, you know, after George W. Bush sold the Iraq war on weapons of mass destruction, you know, all the lies of, of the, you know, and false projections, and we'd be greeted as liberators, it'd be paid for in oil, and, you know, he was in on 9-11, just all of these things that turned out to be completely wrong. Obama sold his signature uh, uh, legislative achievement uh, under uh, uh, under blatant lies, like if you like your doctor, you can keep your doctor. And they've just been lied to so many times that when they try to kind of create this outrage about Donald Trump told a lie or Michael Flynn told a lie. I think most of the American people just kind of roll their eyes at this stuff. Like they don't believe it anymore. They, they, like you said, they couldn't find these countries on a map. It has absolutely nothing to do with their life. And then, of course, they, they've also actually been paying the price for this. And maybe they, they haven't. You know, it's not like they've been taxed. Like there's been a war tax because we've just been borrowing and printing the money. But. They're seeing their their family members come home, you know, wounded or dead or or just, you know, depressed. I mean, the, the amount of soldier suicides, the you know, it's like you, you can't add up the human cost of all this stuff. And I, I, I of course, why would they want to keep doing this? It's insane. Well, I know you know S.E. Cup a little bit. She's at CNN. I think you were on her show a few times. Now, she's uh, been tweeting all this week about this stuff, and she really strikes me as as the perfect example of a pundit who's sort of clueless both ideologically and in terms of facts on the ground, but nonetheless holds a very strong opinion <laughs> <laughs> on this. And there's again, there's something unsettling about seeing people with – in Nassim Taleb's uh, version of, of the world have no skin in the game – be so bloodthirsty and call yeah. for these wars to just go on and on. Yeah, it's really it's 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 a shame because it's uh it's Essie's worst issue. It's the issue she's the worst on, and it's the one that she's most passionate about. And mm. it 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 used to just drive me crazy because I I would argue with her all the time on this, and it would just seem it was like you know um like trying to punch a brick wall, like you just never make any any progress at all. Um. And and I would say these things to her, like, you know, I, I remember her talking about it, like, like her, the way she phrases it is pretty much that Assad started killing all of his, his own people. He's just some bloodthirsty maniac. And then we had to go in to try to prevent that situation from getting worse and to also try to deal with ISIS. But I, again, I mean, I just think it, it's like people can just Google this stuff. It's, mm -hmm. it's, you can, you can just Google, uh, operation, uh, uh timber sycamore. This happened before before Assad was was killing anybody. Uh, we had plans to to overthrow him. It was a, a CIA Saudi led operation, and this is it, it's just so obvious that we created. You know, we this situation would not have happened without Western intervention. Um, the, the idea of of arming every anti Assad rebel and then you know directly funding and arming ISIS or what became ISIS. Um, and, and Assad did respond in brutal fashion and called in the Russians and the Iranians and all this other stuff. But it's it, it really is amazing to just see how wrong they get it and and how passionate they are. And and then the other thing that and, and we'll see how this goes. And this might be the bad part, you know, for for us, uh, which is why we got to be cautiously optimistic. But of course, if anything bad happens now, this is going to get played out. You know, it, it'd be completely exaggerated and it'll all be blamed on Donald Trump. So if you have uh, this Operation Timber S uh, Sycamore uh, that Obama and the CIA and the Saudis launch and the result of it is years and years of civil war, somewhere uh, in the neighborhood of 500,000 people dying, children dying, just an absolute disaster, that never gets blamed on the intervention. But when we leave and the Turks are about to come in and start fighting the Kurds and, the, you know, whatever happens there is going to happen, a any death like if anyone gets a paper cut over there, it's going to be blamed on Donald Trump leaving. Well, when Essie Cup says "we," I think she means the royal "we." That's I, right. I think I, I think Christmas time at Park Slope will be largely <laughs> unaffected. Uh, That's right by, by our actions in Syria. Yeah, you know, I wanted to, to ask you did, if you saw this tweet today from Trump saying, "Does the USA want to be the policeman of the Middle East, getting nothing but spending precious lives and trillions of dollars protecting others who, in almost all cases, do not appreciate?" what we are doing. I saw a lot of people retweeting this. And it just shows you Trump's uncanny ability 
to radically change the story in just a day or two when things appear to be going horribly for him on the border wall or midterm elections or Mueller's probe. You know, he's, he just has this ability to, to shift gears and throw all media into some sort of hyperdrive and distract him. Yeah, it's so it's so strange. And it doesn't it doesn't seem like Donald Trump is, you know, he's certainly not like a deep thinking intellectual, but he's got these <laughs> these instincts for how to control a narrative and how to kind of work a room. And and, and the thing that's that that's crazy is that, you know, there's different ways he could have played this because truthfully speaking, and you know this, you know, better than I do, but he could have bombed another country and that would have gotten more uh, positive press in the mainstream media. It would have gotten more of the establishment on his side than, than ever before. That would almost be the safer move. But he's going the other route and saying, I'm just going to appeal to the people and go over your head like that dynamic you were talking about, the beltway versus, versus regular people. He's going, I'm going with them and I'm going to start pulling out of these wars and see how you like that. And now he puts them in the position of saying Donald Trump is crazy because he doesn't want us to be the policemen of the Middle East. And then like most most people are looking at that and saying like, yeah, but wait a minute, why are we? Why are we doing that again? To, to b- Because Al Qaeda attacked us in 2001, but we're on the same side as Al Qaeda in every conflict that we're in in the Middle East right now. So it's pretty yeah. impossible to defend. Well, he's writing these tweets himself, clearly. Yeah. And he's scheduling them and deciding to tweet. And God knows, probably up at 4 a.m., pounding Diet Coke and watching Fox News and just issuing these tweets. It's it's an unbelievable thing to watch. Um, have you followed at all uh, some of the fallout from the Weekly Standard closing, which I think is tangentially related to this because it, it's, it suggests that neoconservative foreign policy influence is potentially waning or at least facing a lot of pushback. Uh, Rand Paul got involved in that a little bit. Did you see him tweeting sort of a crowing about the death of uh, Bill Crystal's baby? Yeah, I did. I did see that. And then I saw, you know, some the Ben Shapiro and other uh, other Ben Shapiro types kind of going back and forth with Rand Paul. I mean, I I think it's great. I, I think that um, it it's it's weird. Again, it's the same divide you were talking about. But the, the neocon following has been dead for a long time. It's just that they have a lot of influence still amongst uh, uh, amongst the power brokers. But, you know, if you want to actually see who is still of the people are behind the neocon uh, policies or the neocon ideas. I, all you have to do is look at Jeb Bush's presidential campaign. I mean, that's that's the amount of support that they have at this point. There is there is nobody uh, you the, it, it is really kind of nice to see that you can only be so spectacularly wrong uh, and and have your policies result in so much death and destruction before it's just not that popular anymore. Well, you know what's exciting to me is the the article that Rand tweeted was from this new newish website called American Greatness, and this was created by the Claremont Institute, which, you know, five or ten years ago would have been ideologically very close to, let's say, National Review. Uh, it's got people like Victor Davis Hanson, Angela Cotavilla, right. uh, but they have really. Uh, shifted in the last year or two and become very pro-Trump. And, and so you've got these people who, on the one hand, are Jaffaites. They're very pro-cult of Lincoln. They, but but now they're kind of pro-Trump and anti-neocon. So it's a huge division in, in conservatism, Inc. And it's really interesting to me. But what shocked me about Rand was that the article, the particular article that he tweeted by a guy named Chris Buskirk was really harsh. I mean, I don't know if you read it, but that was a no holds barred, no going back split between whatever kind of new Trump wing of conservatism is is growing, if you want to call it conservatism, versus the old National Review interventionist guys. I mean, this is this is a real split. There's there's some real casualties here. Yeah, and um, I, I didn't actually read the piece. I I saw the tweet, um, but you know I had a baby last week. I've been uh, a little bit uh, uh, behind on stuff. But I, I do think that there, there's there been a huge split. And I think a lot of the credit, even though, as you pointed out, these Victor Davis Hanson guys, like they're not, you know, we certainly have some pretty profound differences with them. But I give a lot of credit to Ron Paul 
and those two campaigns in, in 08 and, and in 2012, where he did kind of split the Republican Party. And as people were getting more and more frustrated with the failed neocon policies, he, I think, made it OK to question everything about this, this the, the mainstream conservative ink. And I, I, I also think that, you know, a lot of these people who are, you know, I, I guess on, on cable news, they're somewhat represented by like the Laura Ingram, uh, you know, wing, Tucker Carlson, people like that, where these are conservatives who went along with the neocon agenda for a while, who now see how how dangerous this is. And and it's not that they have some like libertarian ideology that they they believe in, but they, they see that this stuff is th this is not a, a joke. You can actually wreck the country if we go in this mm -hmm. direction. And uh, they're, they're getting worried about that and thinking that maybe we got to we, we got to rethink, you know, what made us great and what might make us a great country in the future. Well, and that, you know, look, anybody who's against any war for any reason, whether it's just because they hate Trump or because uh, they're from code pick, whatever, I don't care. I'll take it. I'll take yeah. any ad hoc coalition that gets us out of Syria or Afghanistan, even temporarily, is fine by me. But I think when you mentioned Ron Paul, I think we have to realize that philosophically, conservatism is dead. It is ideologically incoherent. It's an ad hoc pinball machine bouncing around uh, non-ideology at this point. There's no, you know, Tucker Carlson and Bill Kristol and Donald Trump and Burke and the National Review guys and Russell Kirk and Bill Buckley. I mean, at this point, they they are all as different as they are alike. And so I personally, I'm, I'm thrilled at the idea that we might, for good and all, bury the Republican Party and and bury this phony conservatism, progressivism driving the speed limit, as Malice says, that we've been hearing about ad nauseum since Reagan. Yeah, no, I, I mean, I, I couldn't agree with you more. I, I loved that Donald Trump came and split up the, the conservative uh, uh, coalition. I love that he fractured the Republican Party. I love that Bernie Sanders uh, had a, a similar effect on the Democrats. And uh, of course, look, I would have liked to see Ron Paul win the presidency. I would have liked to see Rand Paul have a much better uh, showing in the presidential campaign. But short of that, it's not so bad that these th this whole game of, uh, you know, you have to choose between Coke and Pepsi, and basically they taste almost exactly the same, that to see that all uh, getting destroyed, I, I think is a very positive thing. And it's, you know, like with all drastic change, it's it's dangerous to some degree, but it, it, this thing, it, it had to break up one way or the other. And I, I agree with you. I mean, those guys, there is no coherent ideological tie between any of those figures that you just named and the whole the whole like um, era of National Review dominating the conservative coalition is th that's long over. Well, fortunately, all we have to do as libertarians is remain consistent, be anti-interventionism abroad, anti-interventionism domestically, and the logic of it really takes care of itself. We don't have to worry about the political vicissitudes of the day or who's president or not president. That said, Dave, I want to thank you for your time. Ladies and gentlemen, follow Dave Smith on Twitter. You can go to his website and buy his stand-up DVD, and you can watch his show, which is called Part of the Problem on the Gas Digital Network. So I want to take a moment to wish all of you a very, very Merry Christmas, a belated Happy Hanukkah. Have a great weekend and great talking to you, Dave. Same to you, Jeff. Thanks so much for having me. Subscribe to Mises Weekends via iTunes U, Stitcher, and SoundCloud, or listen on Mises.org and YouTube.